Hello everyone, I ho I'm hoping this is working okay. Sorry for the the delay, because we were supposed to start at 7, but um, due to some technical difficulties um, we're a little bit behind, but I'm here now, so um, hopefully there's still a few of you around that want to um, come and chat to me about multi-cat households. Um, so while we're waiting for more people to arrive, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. So um, I'm Lucy and I'm a full member of the APVC. Um, and I have been seeing feline behaviour cases for the past 10 years. Um, multi-cat households and problems in multi-cat households is one of the most common problems that I come across. Um, and particularly during lockdown, I found a massive increase in the amount of um, cases coming up that are focusing on problems between the cats. Um, and I think this is because a, a lot of owners are home more and are noticing a lot of the issues that maybe that, uh, the cats may be having that perhaps may have been overlooked when people are sometimes home only um, during the evenings and overnights and weekends. So um, it's been really interesting to have a lot of these cases pop up again and it's been lovely to see some really successful results. So I'll be looking forward to helping some of you today. Um, I've got some questions here that people have sent through already. But if you have any questions while we're talking, then please do um, uh, post them and then I'll try to answer them. If I can figure out how to read the comments, I will try and answer them as best I can. So, okay, I think there's quite a few people watching, so I'll go ahead and crack on. Actually, I will just show you my cat because he's here in his basket, which I'm sure you'll all agree it's the most adorable thing ever. So I'll try and get him in shot because then at least it's like a bit more interesting for everyone. Okay, so um, the first question I have here is from Eileen, um, and she says that she has two indoor indoor cats. They're bonded brothers and age seven. Um, we live in a small cottage, but but with two catios. There is a possibility of adding a third cat, a petite, friendly female about eight years old. She was used to other cats, as she lived in a loose colony on the streets. So she would confine her to the bathroom initially, and just pondering the wisdom of trying. I don't. I really don't want to stress out my existing cats. My gut feeling is she was settling fine with the boys, but not sure how one in particular would feel about it. So, um, oh, sorry, let me just catch my breath from running around. Uh, yeah, so that is a really good question um, because it's really um, observant of you to realise that adding a new member may obviously bring its own problems with will those cats get on, but it may also disrupt the harmonious relationship that your current cats have at the moment. So cats are very territorial and the dynamics between the relationships um, between all the cats in the household do change when you add or take away another member. Um, the main things to consider are whether your um, household can accommodate another cat physically, so make sure you've got enough space. It's good to hear that you've got two catios, so they have got that extra space that's outside of just the four walls that, that they've got at the moment. Um, and to consider uh, what the resources are like, so whether there's um, enough food and water sources. So obviously there'll be enough food for them all, but it would be useful to provide three separate sources of food, so th three different bowls or however you feed them in different locations, so that they feel that there's no competition over the food. Um, and also consider personalities. Um, do you have one that's really particularly timid or very confident that may clash with the more timid one that you're going to be bringing into the household. So uh, I'm sure you know better than me your, your cat's personalities and just think about whether they'll be complementing each other or may they, whether they may potentially clash. Um, it's the same with thinking about previous, it's previous experiences. So your, the cat that you're bringing in has had good experiences in that she lived in another group, but it is very different when you bring cats inside the household because they are in such a confined space and the, the amount of control over their activities is limited when it's a house cat rather than the cat living on the streets. So have a think about whether that cat will adapt well to home living and whether they'll be happy to share with the other two that you've got. Um, make, make as much use of the space you've got available as possible, so provide lots of high places for them to go. There's lots of space up high in the territory that we don't always utilise, so if you can get some shelving or some tall scratch posts or Clear the tops of wardrobes so you can get your cats to share the space up there. So, fingers crossed that will help you introduce them there. But in, there's no real way to know, to be honest. And sometimes you have to just take a bit of a leap of faith to see whether or not it's the right thing for you. And just to do your best to hope that it works out. But there's never ever any guarantee that it's actually going to go well. 
So I hope that's helpful for you, Eileen. Um, next, we have a question from Anne. So she's put, we have just adopted two male cats from a rescue centre, both black and white, adorable. One is three and one is seven months. They were adjacent, they were in adjacent multi-cat cages and both seemed docile. At the moment, the younger is living upstairs and the older one downstairs. We'd appreciate any thoughts on integrating them. Um, so to me, that sounds like a perfect setup for just bringing them home. So separating them is really good when it's in new territory um, because they don't already have any sort of claim over the territory that, that's available. So it's nice for them to have their own space. Um, but obviously now it's time for them to get together a little bit more. Um, so scent swapping is important. So make sure that you take time to swap their bedding around. Um, and you can spend lots of time with one stroking them um, and getting their scent onto you. And then you can spend lots of time with the other one and doing similar. So by doing that, you'll be... A good part of mixing up their scent and getting that communal um, harmonious scent between the two of them going before they've actually even met. Um, then you want to sort of gradually integrate them into the household. So if your setup is that is such that you can confine a cat to one room and then perhaps let the other cat explore the rest of the home, so there, there should be some areas that the, the other cat has been in previously, then they can have a smell around and think get familiar with the other cat's scent and the other cat's presence because although they're not together at the moment they will be very much aware that the other one is there in the household so it's a good way to get that um, feeling a little bit more prominent between the two of them and then obviously likewise switch that round so you have the other cat confined to a room just for a short amount of time and let the other cat explore. Once that goes well um, then you can consider opening the door just a jar between the two of them or perhaps placing a barrier between them um, so that they can see each other and um, they ha have a bit more of an awareness that the other one is there. But it's very important to go at their pace, so it's hard to say when it's the time to do that. But um, if you've noticed that they have been smelling each other's scents because they were both in, the, in you know, swapped over and they smell each other, um, watch their reaction. Do they seem like a bit fearful, a bit wary of the other cat, or do they seem a bit more confident? And then that will give you an idea of how they're probably going to react once you do let them meet through the barrier. Um, so, yeah, so once you've got the barrier up, what you'll probably find is that when you open the door, both cats will probably immediately be at the door because they'll be like, oh, what's in there? It's that, like, novel interest of something's on the other side of the door. So that's what we want to avoid, really, because that can be quite intimidating for both cats. If they suddenly meet this close, just with a small barrier in between, that can be a little bit intimidating and a little bit too much and too intense for the first meeting. So, um, so what you want to do in that situation is have um, someone on the other side of the door playing with uh, your cat, black and white cat in there, and then you stay the, the other side and you want to keep the cat's attention focused on you rather than at the door. So then they'll have an awareness that the door is open, okay, the cat's over there, I can see them playing, um, but they're not gonna, it's not going to be too intense, they're not going to be right on top of each other. And that way you should avoid the hissing, uh, growling, all that sort of really intense behaviour when they're not really that happy. Um, so once that's gone well and you can leave them to be a little bit more freer, so perhaps you could keep the the barrier up for an increased amount of time and just let them come and go a little bit and just watch them see how they are responding um, when that's gone well uh, then you're at the position where you can take the barrier down and then you and just leave them to it there's no need to carry one from one room into another um, or to you know make them meet or to make them be together just leave them to it let them come and go as they please and like I say keep an eye out and watch their behavior um, see how they do when they pass each other, when, and if there's a lot of staring going on between them. So just um, watch their behaviour and see how it's going. But fingers crossed, if you go gradually um, and at their pace, you will have a successful introduction. It sounds like you've, you've done a, you're on a really good start by separating them in the way that you have. So fingers crossed that will go well. Um, okay. So, a question from Carolina. Uh, which is, hi, I'm wondering if one stressing, if one stressing inducing event, so the stressful event of one of the cats has been exposed to, the others follow to check if she's okay, and there were angry vocalisations and hissing, which I presume could be redirected verbal aggression, if such a thing exists. Could this lead to increased stress and resource guarding or territorial behaviour in cats? Yes, it can. 
Um, what are your tips on reducing the likelihood of resource guarding slash territorial behaviour in cats who have previously happily coexisted since kittens and ensuring they lead happy and stress-free lives indoors? Um, okay, so, yeah, territorial behaviour in cats is so, so common and that's one of the areas where, that I've been seeing a lot lately. Um, so you might see cats, when we say resource guarding, it's more that they'll do it in a really passive aggressive way so they might just lay themselves out in front of the litter tray and obviously it's really hard for the other cat to get past because they're worried that perhaps they might be chased or patted or um, interacted with in some sort of way so it's normally very passive aggressive um, so the way around it is to maximize as many of the resources in the household as you can so if there is competition over the litter trays or you do notice um, there's a lot of blocking going on in that sort of way then you need to have lots more litter trays in to give um, an option so the cat can think, oh, okay, that litter tray is being blocked by whoever, I will go and use that other one over there. So it just gives them a little bit of choice, um, which is going to help them feel more in control of the situation because they do have that option to go elsewhere and it will help them cope um, a bit better with the territorial behaviour of the other one. Um, similarly with food, food is really important and it's something that... Um, I find comes up so many times in, in multi-cat household issues is that people feed their cats together um, and they'll often use that as a an example of when the cats are getting on well so they might say oh they're fighting all the time or they're hissing at each other a lot of the time but they are friends because they will eat together but it's difficult because they haven't really got any other choice if that's the time that they're fed and that's the place that they're fed then they will both be there to be eating because they haven't got any other choice so um Although it may, be, uh, it may be a good thing that they're not fighting over the food, it's normally quite a very tense situation. So there might be hissing um, and swiping and uncomfortable body language between the cats that you may or may not be picking up on. So it's a good idea to just take that completely out of the situation. And if you can, just feed free, free feed as much as you can. So the cats can choose to come and go as and when. There's not that seven o'clock comes um, and you, pat, you know, turn the can opener on and all the cats came running down at the same time and then there's that big tense situation. So they can just come and go when they want to. And if you provide the food in lots of smaller bowls and spread them throughout the territory, then the cat feels like there's no competition for food. There's, I'm surrounded by food, there's as much food as I could possibly need. So um, that's gonna help reduce any competition and reduce that territorial um, behaviour between them and any sort of guarding of the food. Um, what else did I have here? Um, I, I, yeah, I did think here that, um, think about what it was that startled the cats um, and if they did, if there was a stressful event that had um, caused the, the issues between the cats, have a think about whether that's gonna happen again. Um, so if it was a firework, obviously you know to prepare for next year. Um, or if it's you know a certain cat that seems to be skulking around in the garden, you might want to take steps to stop that, that particular cat or all cats coming into the garden. Um, so yeah, so sometimes it is just about managing the situation that you've got on your hands um, and taking steps to try and reduce any sort of negative behaviour between them. Um, and actually, on the subject of food, so. Um, it's a good idea to feed them separately with their meals, but I also find that people tend to use food to lure the cats together to try and um, teach them that the cats, that, you know, it's nice to be around the other cat because they're having treats and they're having food. And I totally get that from a um, like learning theory perspective. You want to associate the cat with the positive experience of the food. But what you'll often find is because it is such a stressful situation being that close to another cat, that they're not actually having a ple positive, pleasant experience at all, they're actually having a very negative experience. Because when cats will hunt, they'll hunt by themselves. So by you luring the cats together um, with the food, they're not actually getting that, it's, it's, it's not natural for them and they're not having a positive experience to be able to associate that with the other cat. So, if, when, so it's a good idea to use food as a reward rather than a lure. So once the cats are together again and if they are acting calmly rather than um, in a territorial way then you can reward them with food when they're apart so the best thing in the world is for them to ignore each other that's what we want um, once you've had an issue with in a multi-cat household so if they are happily sleeping on separate sides of the sofa that's perfect that's amazing like they don't need to be snuggled up together to have a happy relationship in the house they can be 
quite happy living separate lives in the same house. Um, so if they are doing that, then use food as a reward to say, yes, this is what I want, just settle down and don't be being annoying in terms of blocking, chasing, attacking, all these things that you see between cats. Um, okay, it's really weird not having someone to talk to. I feel like I'm just spewing information at everyone. Um, okay, so I have a question from Hannah who has asked, is it better to get two males or two females when, um, when you want to? So my opinion and uh, my experience is that it, it doesn't matter. If, if you're going to neuter the cats, then there is no real difference between whether you have a male or female. Um, if you don't neuter them, that's when you may find there'll be differences because obviously two unneutered males are going to be in competition with each other once they meet, uh, reach sexual maturity. Um, and that's when you will get lots of fighting, spraying, um, and lots of roaming, which, in my opinion, doesn't seem like a very nice cat, or pet cat anyway, because you want your cat to be home more, um, and not fighting, and roaming. So, um, if they are neutered, then it shouldn't make any difference whether you have two males or two males, uh, two females. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of anecdotal um, evidence out there of, of one way or another, but in my experience, it doesn't seem to make any difference. The most important thing to think about when you are getting to is to match on temperament. So you want to make sure that, like I was saying at the beginning, you don't have two personalities that are going to really clash um, and you want the personalities to complement each other, which is a really like woolly thing to say, isn't it? Because I can't really say, well, you want one confident and one timid so that the timid one can you know, go off and hide and the confident one can do what he wants because it doesn't, off it doesn't work. It's not sort of set in stone like that. You just have to sort of do your best to just try and find two temperaments that are going to match um, and they're going to complement each other. Uh, and also make sure, obviously, the environment's right. I think a lot of it does come down to environments. So you could have two perfectly matched temperaments or two temperaments that don't get on at all. But by the way that you handle the environment, so making sure they have got enough space to avoid each other, and that's what we want to give them the opportunity to do, is to avoid each other. So if they do have a clash, then they have got the opportunity to um, to go into a different room or to sleep in a different bed, and they're not living on top of each other in that way. It can really diffuse any tension between them. Um, okay, so my final question I've had in advance is, I have two cats, a girl and a boy, that fell out after my girl had a fight with my neighbour's cat. I've separated them during the night when, when I can't supervise them, but she will still chase my boy during the day. What can I do? Um, so, so if, if they're separated at the moment, just overnight, the problem with separating overnight is often, sometimes it's essential for safety reasons. If you feel like your cat, um, if one's terrorising the other and there's risk of injury or just anxiety basically, then it is good to separate them. But the problem that you have there is that by that point, the, both cats now have a restriction on the territory and this can make them anxious in another way. So now they have the tension between them to deal with, um, which is bad enough as it is, but now they can't go into that room that they want to go in and they can't go into the bedroom where they usually sleep and it's all, it, it becomes a, a horrible situation um, for, for a lot of cats, especially if, if you're, normally the family is in one part of the house during the evening or during the night. So you'll find that one cat is in with the owner in bed and the other cat is left out in the lounge. And I've had owners that swap round or separate and one will sleep downstairs, one will sleep upstairs. So it can become a bit of a take, taking over life, basically. Um, so my advice in, in that case is to put any environmental modifications you can in place. And by that I mean to maximise the spaces, lots of high places, lots of hiding places, get the resources right so there's loads to go round and then try and get them back together as quickly as you can. And it should be easier because they are familiar with each other and if they had a good relationship before, then hopefully that should come back. But um, while they are separated, you'll probably have a situation where in the morning you open the door and the cats will burst, or one cat will burst through because they'll be like, I'm here, I'm, it's me. Um, and then already the arousal level is really high. So they don't have that opportunity to just come and go as they please with one sleep here and the other one doing this it's, it's first thing in the morning you'll get that sudden burst of novelty where oh good I'm allowed into the lounge and they'll go charging in oh where's the other cat and it's just a bit yeah it's a it's high high arousal that you want to take out of the situation altogether so once they're back together you might find things improve a lot better because they can they, they are much more control of the situation they can come and go when they please 
Um, and once they have that control, they feel more confident and more uh, reassured about the whole situation. Um, what else did I say about that? Uh, yeah, and uh, I find a lot of the tension tends to happen on ground level. So if there is a lot of chasing happening or staring or blocking, this tends to happen on the ground or on the floor, basically. So as many high places as you can get, as well as providing the additional space, it, it allows them to stay out of each other's eye line a little bit more. So if one's hanging out on the top of a scratch post and the other walks walks from you know one room to the other, then hopefully that will happen without an issue. When previously, if they were both on the floor, you might notice that the staring will ramp up and um, one might stalk the other and it's just a bit tense and a bit like, oh, can I pass, can I not pass? So as many high places as you can put in is going to be really helpful in getting them back together. Um, so I hope that answers the question. I'm sorry if I'm rambling on. Um, okay, let's have a look. I'm just going to see if I can look at these comments to see if there's any more questions. Okay. So Carolina has said... Oops. Thanks so much for answering. What if one lays down on the stairs? Should I physically separate them when they're eating, i.e. pick one up and put it out in a separate room? Um, they actually agree each other in the morning. Isn't it? Okay, so what if one lays down on the stairs? The stairs, I find, again, is another really difficult area for a lot of cats, particularly if it's the only route upstairs, which obviously for most places it is. And that's because there isn't really much you can do by way of giving them an alternative way up. You can't, unless you want to provide an extra set of steps, going up the wall for one to go up the steps and one to go on, on the actual stairs. It's difficult, and it's difficult to provide hiding places on the stairs as well, which is another way of, of, giving, um, of getting out the other one's way. So, yeah, that is a really difficult one. And I would just say that make sure upstairs and downstairs has everything the cats need in terms of food, water, litter trays, scratch posts, places to sleep, places to play, your, your attention. Um, so you just make sure that, if they, that they have everything they need in both areas so that they're only having to cross on the stairs if they absolutely need to. Um, and if you find that one is already laying on the stairs and the other one can't cross, I just try to distract as much as possible. So the one laying on the stairs, call him to you. Um, try not to go and physically move them because you might find that that upsets them and they might, depending on the personality of your cat, you might get scratch um, or it might make them happy. But So yeah, just try to distract them, call them over, wave a toy around and just try to diffuse the tension a little bit. But that is one of the ones that I find really difficult to overcome, the stairs. It's like you want a little like separate cat staircase but it's not really doable in most people's houses um so also should i physically separate them when they're eating i.e pick one up and put one in a separate room where there'll be food to make them aware of the new location um if you put down multiple bowls of food they will just gravitate towards them they'll know they're there because they'll be able to smell them um and i would tend to find that they'll probably stick to one or another and you'll probably find that oh this cat tends to eat from this bowl and the other cat tends to eat from that bowl, which is absolutely fine. They don't need to eat from the certain bowls that we have in mind that they might want. Um, so I just put down as much as you can and then just let them go for it. Um, if you find that they're eating from each other's bowls and it's becoming a problem, so uh, your cat might be eating and the other one will come along and put their nose in and push the other one out, um, then I would separate them with a door in between. So put the food down. Um, if, if you're not free feeding already, put the food down and then close the door in between so they don't have the opportunity to do that because it's really common and it's often mis misconstrued by owners as them sharing. So, oh, she'll just step back and let him eat when actually what's probably happening is she's thinking, oh, fine, you have it. Like, And it's probably a very anxious, um, tense situation. So we don't want that happening. So if you can, you can give them the opportunity to eat elsewhere, then that's super. Um, um, one more comment from Carolina is... They actually groom each other normally, so this is a new development. Oh, okay, so this sounds like they had a really good relationship previously. And I do find that once they've had that basis, um, then the prognosis of them getting on again is much higher than, than cats that previously didn't get on with. Um, sorry, my other cat is being annoying. Um, so, yeah, so fingers crossed they will get back on track. Um, and it's, it is normally about environmental um, things to manage that and hopefully they'll be back to grooming each other again soon. Uh, okay, another question. Is it possible that one cat is more socially awkward than others? One of mine demands cuddles 
or to be groomed by the other two and pushes herself onto them and the other two are not impressed. It's adorable. Oh, it says Seymour uh, when she does this. Is it normal? How can I help resolve this? Uh, socially awkward, that's an adorable term. Um, yeah, I, I would say they, they all have differences in terms of how sociable they are um, and they all have their unique personality. So yes, they can definitely um, vary in terms of social awkwardness. Um, when you say demands cuddles, I'd like to know um, what, what exactly is happening there because I, it tends to be that if, like my cats, they get on fine and I notice that one will come over and lick the other's head like really like vigorously um, and I think, well, he technically is grooming him and that's like me saying, oh, look, they're grooming. But what's actually happening is he's just coming over and licking Fig's head and he's just putting up with it. So I sort of find that to be less of like a mutual nice um behaviour and more sparks just being like oh I just want to lick your head now um, so yeah so I guess it depends on the the dynamics between them if cats are happy with that behaviour and they're happy to be imposed on and cuddled up to then it's fine but others might think no I'm not happy with this and they want to get up and leave so um, is it normal yes and how can you help resolve it mm, that's a tricky one uh, just making sure that their needs are met in any any other sort of way so if she needs lots of cuddles then maybe you could give the one to give her could be the one to give her more cuddles or make sure there's enough resting areas so is it that she wants a cuddle or is it that she wants to sleep on the bed that the other cat's sleeping on or that particular part of the sofa or that particular part of your bed um, so just make sure there's enough resting areas similar resting areas for all of them so that they don't all fight over the same space um, okay do you have recommended ways to introduce two cats in a new household that we might often miss? Also, what recommendations do you have for cats in rescue centres? From Julia. Um, okay, do you have a recommended way to introduce two cats in a new household? So, yeah, so, we, so it's a little bit the same as I was saying at the beginning. Um, if they're two new cats, then it's fine to separate them and re reintroduce um, trying to have the territory overlap a little bit, so giving them access to communal areas at separate times. Um, I guess that would be the same from Cats in a Rescue, if that's what you're referring to. The only way it would be different is if you were to bring home a kitten um, to a cat that's exist already sort of existing in the household. And in that way, then um, you could just confine the kitten to one room and the, the cat would have the rest of the house. Um, and that's whether it be from a rescue centre or or a breeder or from somewhere. Um, so in that way the kitten only has one little room to get used to and can feel build its confidence and get used to its new surroundings um, and then you want to gently integrate the kitten into the household um, because it's so difficult for an adult cat living with a kitten and I know the, the research is that they're more likely to be accepted and I think in general yes they are because the kitten is less of a territorial threat and it's more it's more um, easy for the adult cat to accept that into their environment however the kitten play drive is absolutely through the roof and often the adult cat is the kitten's target because yes you can develop, you can put all your energy into playing with them with toys but eventually there's nothing happening in the house everything's still and quiet and all of a sudden this cat moves from a to b and the kitten's like whoa it's something to play with and jumps on them or tries to entice them into some sort of play um, and which is really difficult for any adult cat to, to get to grips with, as, as I'm sure most of us can imagine what that must be like. So um, it's not without its issues and there's no guaranteed way of getting two cats to get on, regardless of their, what age. Um, but that's the only way I would do it differently if it was a kitten. Um, if that makes sense. Is whisker fatigue a real thing? Sorry to be asking many questions. I've never heard of whisker fatigue. Um, is that when you say that, so I've recommended in the past that cats eat from shallow dishes and shallow bowls and drink from shallow bowls so that when they put their face in the whiskers aren't pushed back because that may sort of upset the whiskers and make them feel uncomfortable because they are such sensitive um, hairs on their faces. Um, but since then I was reading that actually that may not actually be a thing and the cats given the choice weren't, um, weren't preferring to eat from a shallow dish and I don't know whether that's because they're used to the feeling so they don't actually care um, or whether um, that is actually you know it doesn't really make any difference to them um, so 
I don't know, it's difficult to say, but the whiskers are actually amazing. I was reading about all the different things the whiskers can pick up on, and I recently saw a blind cat for a behaviour problem, and he was amazing, all the things he could do. Um, he was going up and down scratch towers and negotiating the territory absolutely fine, and I think the whiskers played a big part in that, and that it can detect airflow, so it knows there's a, a barrier there because there's no air coming past, and I was, like, amazed, as I am by everything cat. So, um... Yeah, I'd love to talk more about whiskers, but I don't really know much um, about whisker fatigue, so I'm sorry. Um, how do you give suggestions for alternatives to scruffing? Um, I presume that means in the veterinary setting, um, and I don't really have much experience in a veterinary setting, um, but I would probably suggest that um, they are not scruffed and restrained in a different way, and I guess it would depend on what the procedure was that they're trying to get done. Um, the problem is that ideally you want to be able to get the cat, the cat used to and familiar with handling and being restrained and all these different things but um, in practicality it's sometimes not always doable to, to you know, not everyone's actually got their kitten used to all these um, ways of being restrained so if they can't be restrained maybe wrap them in a towel, is that what most people, vets are doing now? I don't know if that's bad advice, um, I, I would probably want to direct that more to a vet rather than myself. Um, but yeah, definitely a note of scruffing, as far as I'm aware. Um, let's see. Okay, so going back to the cuddling. One is laid down relaxing and the social awkward one comes over and leans into the one who's laid down. Sometimes the one who's laid down will start grooming, other times the one who's laid down does a fed up meow. Um, yeah, I would probably say that that's more to do with that cat wanting to be in that space but that the other cat is in. Or perhaps wanting the social social contact of being, um, like it may be a bit one-sided, that the other cat wants to come and snuggle up um, in the way that bonded cats do, but the other cat's not really feeling it. Or maybe feeling it sometimes and not other times. Um, which doesn't really help, but it is difficult to know with the multi-cat household. Because we look at cats outside of the home, and they do have all these lovely behaviours where they'll snuggle up together and they'll wash each other, and everything's just all lovely and relaxed and happy. But these are cats that are literally in 100% control of their, their environment, their, their movements. They, if they want to go, they just can go. Um, and they can choose who they interact with. Whereas now, we've, we've chosen who they have to live with. Um, and we're, cho we're choosing the environment they've got and their food. They don't often hunt for their own food. We choose their food and we tell them when it's available. So I think the social construct and the social structure of how cats actually live is changing. And... I don't think we can really put a finger on how it's working yet because there's basically not much research um, on social behaviour in cats inside houses at the moment so I'd love to see more and that would definitely be something that I'd like to see um, looked at in more detail if, whether it's one-sided because I think in your situation Carolina you have one cat that really wants that social um, contact and the other cats sometimes just aren't feeling it so um, yeah but, and, and to be honest a fed up meow is not really a big issue. Like, yes, we'd love them to be friends, but as long as there's no real tension between them and no aggression, um, then, they're, then they're fine. I'm sure they're fine. They're fine. Um, okay. That's exactly what I mean. I heard the whiskers don't touching bowls. Oh, yes. So that is what we were saying about whiskers touching bowls. Um, okay. Is there any other questions that anyone would like to ask? Or shall we leave it at that? I'll just... I'll just give you a minute to see. I wonder if there's anything that I've come across that's worth mentioning. I think everything's come up, really. Yeah. I think it's difficult. A lot of my cases I've had recently, some have gone so well, and the cats have literally changed from being worse enemies to best friends. Whereas some others, we try and we try and we try and we do everything possible um, to try and get them back together. And it's just sometimes when you have a breakdown in a relationship between two cats, for whatever reason, um, sometimes it can just be permanent. And it's heartbreaking to see, particularly if they were really bonded beforehand. Um, but yeah, sometimes that's what um, what you get. And it's difficult with cats because they're so independent and it, you can't really train them to do what you want them to do from a social perspective. You can't make them be friends. Um, and that's what I was saying about the treats. There's no way to really get them together and say, look, 
he is nice. Um, you can be friends, you can do this, because it's just so, um, so complicated with cats. They're complicated little beings. Um, okay, one more question is, how to build confidence in a really shy cat? Uh, I wonder what you mean by shy. Is it that they're shy, people shy? Um, in which case, make sure they've got somewhere to to be, to retreat to, so um, a safe space that they can have. I saw someone built their cat a little pillow fort the other day on the internet, which was adorable. So build your cat a pillow fort um, and hand feed as much as you can it, and spend get, take time to to just be there with her and let her confidence come out with you. Um, but hand feed her if you can with some really, really like tempting food. Um, and just take it really slow and go at her pace. Um, yeah, that's a really complicated question. Um, but I would be happy to talk in more detail if you wanted to, if you had a specific cat in mind. Um, but yeah, it, I think with cats, with every behavior problem, you have to do what they, what they need. Everything has to be on their terms, which sounds nuts, but they're little control freaks. And it, once they have the control and they, they do feel more confident and they feel safer and they feel happier. So, um, I tend to take all of my cases from coming in from the cat's point of view, even if they're being absolutely horrible and they're beating up the other cats and they're beating up the owners, I tend to think, well, I'm on that cat's side, really. I'm going to try and get everything right for that cat. Um, and then it should, that should solve the problem. Um, so, yeah. So, okay, I'm going to leave it there, if that's okay. So thank you, everyone, for joining me. Uh, thank you for the questions before, and I'll be happy to answer any ones after if you wanted to comment below. Um, but then I'll just leave it here for now. Okay, thank you.